as a jazz musician, there are very, very few people who have the talent to play this music in, in the style that he plays it in. I love watching him live. I love it when he's wild, when he hoofs with his crew and they just are very free. You feel like he's directly singing to you, which is the, which is the gift of a, a truly talented performer. He just touches you. And now the purple dusk of twilight time steals across the meadow. I don't think he wants to be boxed in. I don't think he wants to be put in one lane musically. Uh, and, I, and I think he's, he's going to do what he feels uh, is needed to make him happy. It had to be you, wonderful you. It had to be you. Throw me something, mister. Action. Got my ticket in my hand And I'm going down to New Orleans Yes, I will When I get to New Orleans I'm going to see that door the great thing about New Orleans and about Bourbon Street is they have music playing all the time. In the uh, wee hours in the morning and even like on Saturday and Sunday afternoons, I've uh, come down here a lot since I moved away when I was 18. And uh, I still get the same feeling, you know, the smells down here. Some of them uh, actually aren't as, <laughs> as pleasant as you uh, would, would hope. but. Um, just the, the sights and the sounds of the French Quarter. Right now we're uh, in front of a place that brings back probably the fondest memories for me in the French Quarter. It's called the Maison Bourbon. I probably came here for the first time when I was maybe five or six years old. My parents would bring me down here uh, as a kid uh, along with my older sister. We would come in and listen to jazz music. When I was about three years old, I remember we had a piano in our house and I was fascinated with the process of, of touching one of these notes and, and hearing a sound come out. And then I, I sort of remember playing two notes and three note combinations and hearing the different harmonies. And I was fascinated by that. I thought it was a big toy. Um, so I started sort of picking out little songs by ear. My left hand would pound on all four beats, so it was the sort of thing you wouldn't want to you wouldn't want to hear for long periods of time. I would play classical music. I would study things like uh, Chopin. What was fascinating when I look back on my life was that not only did I have the training of the the sort of standard piano teacher but I also had the whole New Orleans heritage to draw from. So we would go down to the French Quarter and, and I would hear traditional jazz piano players. So while I was studying more of a classical style, I was also learning the traditional jazz at the same time. had played in New Orleans from the time when he was very young. His mother liked music and I liked music. When we would go to these places, uh, they would let him sit in with the band. He did a number with the band, uh, and then he did a second song with the band as time went on. When I got to be about, uh, say, 10 or 11, uh, I, I really started hanging out with a guy named James Booker. Now, James Booker is a piano player from New Orleans. They called him the Black Chopin sometimes. 
Well, in the case of James Booker, you have the classic relationship of the master and the apprentice. Booker knew that Harry was a, was a very talented musician. He could tell, he could pick up the songs fast, he could hear. And when you're an older musician, you're always looking for younger musicians who have that type of ability. He had enormously long fingers, and I remember he would, he would modify the way he played to, to accommodate my hands, because when I was a kid, my hands were only, you know, they were very small, and he had these giant hands, so he would take these incredible arrangements that he had on the piano and show me how to play them as a little kid. He would play... modify it to something like this. And the problem was that he died before my hands grew big enough to really get all of his secrets. So I had to figure a lot of this stuff out after he died. While I was hanging out with James Booker, I was also studying formally with um, probably the greatest teacher I've ever had, Ellis Marsalis. I started about age 13 and at that time, Bourbon Street was primarily what we call traditional jazz. That is, jazz that was played by Louis Armstrong and Joe Oliver, Bob Moran and the Humphrey Brothers. I first saw Harry when he was about 11 years old after he had auditioned for a spot to play a movement of a major concerto. Harry had an ideal situation in the sense that not only was he very talented, but he had supportive parents who would see to it that he, had, he was exposed to the best that was available. My mother wanted to be a musician very badly, I think. She, she had a flute, she played the flute, but I don't think she really had the talent to be a professional musician. So when I came around and it looked like I had, you know, a natural desire to play and maybe a little bit of talent to go along with it, she flipped out, man. She, I remember her uh, st literally standing behind me when I was practicing my, my Bach inventions and knocking me on the head, you know, when, uh, when I made a mistake. And it got to the point where I would develop this twitch where I, when I'd see her coming around, you know, I'd, I'd cock my head to the side while I was playing because I knew that that big noogie was coming on, t on top of my head. My mother was from New York City. My dad is from Mobile, Alabama. They were very strong-willed people. My mother was a judge. My father is the district attorney of New Orleans. And I think I gained a lot of the qualities that, that I'm still developing from them. Susanna's interest was in languages and Harry's was in music. got to the point where uh, he had a repertoire of uh, Dixieland, New Orleans music. He was about 10 and uh, he made a, seat, uh, a record at that time, a long play record, with about, I think, 10 songs on it with some of the really good musicians from New Orleans. He played at the Jazz and Heritage Festival here. He did a lot of benefits on different occasions in town. When I first met Harry Connick Jr., he was taking uh, piano lessons from my father. And I was the eldest of six boys. So my brother Winton, I, Winton and I would spend a lot of time you know, roughing up our younger brothers. Because Harry's father was basically the district attorney, but he was always working. So he had a driver, and the driver would drive Harry to our house, and we'd wait for him, and we'd like rough him up a little bit on the porch, shake him around and punch on him, and then he'd go in and take take a lesson with my dad, and this went on for five or six years. Well, I guess I can rest easy if I saw him in Carnegie Hall as a great pianist or a com great composer. You know, I'd like someone to say, look, there goes Beethoven's mother. <laughs> I would love that. I would love that. My mom died when I was 13, so she wasn't around really when I was making career decisions. 
Harry's mother always told him that, that you should be the leader. You should be the one to, to innovate. You should be the one to, uh, to be aggressive when it comes to, your, into your, to music, to your profession. And uh, he did that at a, at a very young age. Well, it's, it's really an experience, you know, like I, I've played with, with jazz bands and, and do that kind of thing a lot, but it's, it, every time it seems to get better and better because, you know, you, don't, you know how it's going to sound, but you don't really know how it's going to come out. And, you know, if it, if it comes out good, then you're happy. If it comes out bad, then, you know, you're depressed. But, um, you know, I feel really good after something like that happens. Harry Connick Jr. always did like an audience. He was a real precocious kid. It was obvious at the time that he was very comfortable in a performing role. When Harry first came to Jesuit High School, I was his eighth grade speech teacher. And uh, Harry was, was, was quite a character in, in class. Uh, he was someone that was able to get up in front of the class, give a speech without even preparing. So sometimes that was sort of frustrating to me because I wanted to be able to say, Harry, this is what you got to do. Somehow, Harry already knew what he was supposed to do. His mother saw to it that he attended NOCA, the New Orleans Center for the Creative Arts down here. Ellis Marcellus was his teacher there. And sometimes his teacher would call me up. Betty would call me and say, Harry hasn't been practicing. There's a competition coming up. And you need to know that. So when he came in for his jazz lesson, I wouldn't let him do it. I said, no, you're going to practice your box so you, you'd be ready for the competition. And I'd always tell him, I said, you know, you're going to go in one of these competitions and you're going to be severely embarrassed because some of these kids are going to really make you look bad. So you need to practice. But the only problem was he never lost any of those competitions. We attended Jesuit High School as teenagers, and um, it was a very strict school. Sonny Borey, who was our teacher, taught theater production when we were seniors, and Harry was involved in, in a couple of plays. I think Guys and Dolls was one of them. Um, he actually played piano in the orchestra pit, then would leave the orchestra pit and get on stage and, and to hit a part in the play. We also did Ain't Misbehaving which is a Fats Waller play. But that was actually the first time Harry ever played stride piano. He just sat there and played the whole, you know, the whole show, an hour and a half straight on piano. When I was about 14, I got a phone call from a guy named Johnny Horn. And Johnny Horn was one of the great New Orleans trumpet players. He's no longer with us. But I remember he, uh, he called me to, to come down and play a gig with him. And uh, I asked my dad, I said, can I, can I play with him? You know, he says, well, when is it? I said, well, it's next week, and it's, it's Monday through Saturday uh, from 11 to 3 in the morning, you know, and I knew my dad was going to say no. And uh, he said, yeah, you can, you can go ahead and play it. You know, I couldn't believe it. And the great thing about it is the musicians that I, I had the good fortune of playing with were around when, when jazz music was being invented. These were the real guys, and uh, I learned a lot, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm really proud to be from here, from New Orleans. I live in a tiny closet, a lukewarm cold water flat. It's often been said, the thing about being young is that you're too stupid to know any better. And that was certainly the case with me when I went to New York, and it was definitely the case with Harry when he went to New York. I don't worry about the ride or the subway fare, cause I know. My dad, he wanted me to go to college. He said, look, you can move to New York when you're 18 if you go to Loyola University in New Orleans uh, for a little while. So I did, a little while being the operative phrase. I went there for about a semester at the most. I started off with uh, 18 hours, and like by the third week, I, I had three hours. <laughs> I wasn't uh, 
I wasn't particularly uh, successful in that environment, but I did move to New York when I was 18. Who cares if the floor ain't level? The ceiling falls in. I had these blinders on uh, with regard to, to my career, and uh, you know, I don't care if I was broke or, or you know, if I didn't have a place to live. You know, at one point, man, I had my suitcases on my way to the Port Authority to sleep because I had no place to stay. And I called my good buddy uh, Winton Marsalis and said, Bro, I need a place to stay tonight. He said, Come on over to my place. Well, when he first came to New York, he used to come come with me, stay with me. I see him every day. He come by the house. He cook some good uh, black eyed peas, and uh, we would talk about music and um, just discuss a lot of different things. Any anybody, when you come from a foreign place and you 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 go from like New Orleans to New York, you want to have somebody that you know that you can rely upon. That you can go to their house. You can rap with them. The idea that New York was supposed to be this fearful city. You know, city full of cutthroats and people who would like stab you in the back was never anything that really concerned us because one of the things that we learned in school is that um, unlike a corporate situation in the United States, there is very little backstabbing to be done on a musical front because all the backstabbing in the world is not going to make a guy who can't play suddenly learn how to play. And if you can play, you will get the gig. And the more important thing was the fact that my dad, if, if I, I knew he was going to send me a, a check to pay the rent <laughs> if I needed it. So, you know, I, I, felt, I felt pretty good. I, I was in a very, very fortunate situation. I did not have to go up there and, you know, tend bar or wait tables or anything like that. I was really lucky. I got musical jobs right away, you know, playing in bars and I played in, uh, in churches and any place I could. some smaller clubs in New York, solo piano clubs, and then um, I think within almost a year, maybe a year and a half, he was signed to Columbia Records. When I did my first uh, CD for Columbia Records, I was 19, and I was going to play with a trio. Well, the drummer canceled, he couldn't make it, so it was just me and a bass player. And then a week before the session, the bass player canceled, so it was just me. So I played solo piano, the guy at Columbia liked it, so I did a record of, that was primarily solo piano. When he was living in New York, and when he was playing music, he received virtually no attention from the critics, the jazz critics, the writing press. Uh, perhaps because he was white, and perhaps because they had some perverse notion that he hadn't paid enough dues. And I always thought that the whole idea of playing music was to pay dues in the practice room and that the merit should be doled out based on how well you perform. Wynton Marsalis, he took me down to this club called the Knickerbocker and introduced me to Harry. And this was in 1988 and um, it was, like something I'd never seen before. Um, he was just sitting there playing piano, and um, I'd never heard anybody play piano like that. And he invited me to come up and play, and um, it was embarrassing. He, um, I remember it was a Sunday night because the Saints were playing a football game, and uh, so he said, let's play the Saints, go marching in. And uh, here I was, a kid from St. Louis, and I didn't know it. I went down! to St. James Infirmary. I found my baby there. When I was a kid, I would always sing like Louis Armstrong. He was sort of my, my hero. So communicating to a crowd of people by singing was something that came very naturally to me. I guess maybe when I was 16, 17, 18, when my voice started to mature, I started to contemplate singing in other styles. Um, I would listen to everyone from Stevie Wonder to Billy Joel to uh, Perry Como, Nat Cole, Frank Sinatra. Of me. Why not take all of me? Frank Sinatra was a definite influence. It was, you know, a lot of the other singers of that era. 
found you Take my arm I'll never I guess when I was about 19, that was the first time I actually stood up with a microphone and did not play the piano and, and entertained as a singer. I'd rather he just loves to entertain people. He, he likes to, when he walks into a room, he has complete control. And you can kind of see that, you know, he just kind of takes over the room. Um, his, his personality is just that, that big of a thing. When, when he was doing shows with me on stage, he's a total natural on stage. Uh, it, it's like he was meant to be there, like he was meant to be on stage. Some of those I've seen might never be mean. Might Most people simply, they never heard of Harry until he sang on the soundtrack for When Harry Met Sally. For nobody else gave me a thrill. With all your faults, I love you still. It had to be you, wonderful you. It had to be you. When I did the soundtrack, I sang in front of an orchestra for the first time. I mean, there were maybe 60 or 70 musicians in the studio, and I was singing with them. And I said, man, this is awesome. So, you know, next thing you know, I got a, I have a, I'm schlepping around, the, you know, music for, for a big orchestra. When the soundtrack to When Harry Met Sally came out, we were playing venues that were tenfold as big as the places I had been playing before. So we hired a big band. He uh, convinced me to move to, um, to New Orleans to study with, with his mentor, which is Winton's father, Ellis Marsalis. And that's how I ended up down here. And I was here for a couple weeks, and Harry called me and said, look, I'm putting together this big band. I want you to play trumpet in it, and let's go to work. It's hot dog, slam bang. Thanks for coming late to the show. Really appreciate it. When the big band finally came together, I was 19 years old, and I was the only guy in the band that was younger than Harry. The band was filled with some of the greatest musicians, musicians from New Orleans, such as Leroy Jones, Lucian Barber, and Craig Klein, Shannon Powell. Guys, they had been playing their instruments longer than I had been alive. Right with me. I was very happy for Harry when Harry met Sally, came along and he got his big band and started doing big band music. He started to become popular in a, in, in a segment of the American population that I was always never very comfortable with. Just those entertainment type people, people who love him because he sings. You know, people who really never had a grasp on his talent as a musician. What most people don't know is that he was an absolutely extraordinary musician. I've watched him, I've laid on a couch in a hotel room and watched him sit at a table and write um, the complete scores of a full orchestral of uh, the Christmas record that I played on. We were in Zurich, Switzerland, and he wrote the whole thing in a matter of two weeks. I knew when he was in high school that he was interested in composing because whenever I would come to town, I would see him and he would play some of his songs for me. And some of the tunes he would play for me, I actually, I can still remember. The songwriting with words came after Harry Met Sally. Missed the Saturday dance. It was a while back when Harry Met Sally has, was just coming out, and no one really knew who he was, and I was one of them. I modeled for about 12 years and I was out in California doing a job out there and I was checking out of my hotel. I was swimming in the pool at this hotel. She walks by, almost drowned when I saw her. This guy runs up behind me, he's dripping wet and he introduces himself and I hear this southern drawl and I thought, wow, who's this guy? And we immediately clicked and um, I sat down, had lunch with him, 
And it was definitely love at first sight, and he completely changed my life. Darling, I guess my mind's more at ease. But nevertheless... My parents were married for 28 years, uh, and my mom died, and... Uh, that when I when I when I look at my father and when I look at my mother and father together, I saw the only thing that that mattered to me as a human being. One day we'll move uptown or even out to the countryside, and for every leaf on a tree, we'll add one cup to the pride. He was a breath of fresh air to me because he got my feet back on the ground. And it was great to slowly stop modeling and get into something where I could use my brain. He pushed me in the direction of photography, and then one day he said, "Why don't you can do still pictures, why don't you try moving pictures? So he hired me to direct a music video. I know you're there. My mother is a sculptor. She did the Vietnam piece, the memorial for the women in Washington, D.C. And they both have the, the same sign, and they, they hit it off incredible. Harry grew up in a big Catholic family. When, when Harry walks into the room with all his cousins and his father, they all hug and kiss on the lips. And I was like, wow, that's, that's interesting. That's new for me. And when Harry met my father, every time he would see my father or my brother Tim, he would hug him, and they were like, whoa. But now my dad, when he sees Harry, he just runs and hugs him, and it's pretty funny. In 1990, I worked with him for the first time on a uh, jazz trio record called Lofty's Road Souffle. Follow that record, Blue Light, Red Light, which was his next big band record. And I've done everything ever since, including his Christmas record, um, his last orchestral record, his two funk records. There are those that wished that he would have just sat around and sang like Frank Sinatra for the rest of his life. And when Harry was at the pinnacle of his success with a big band, he goes out and gets a little funky New Orleans band. <laughs> it was brilliant. I was definitely, you know, jumping up and down and applauding Harry's decision to do, to follow his own creative juices. I don't base my art on, on success. Um, I go into the studio and I, and, I, and I make music that I want to make, that I really feel like I need to do um, at this particular stage of my development. And if it's a success, it's awesome. And if it's not, it's awesome. He's shown me really a lot in the last couple of years in terms of his real seriousness in addressing music. Because a lot of times you can get out here and you get publicity and you become known for something. And uh, you start to figure out that none of it is actually based on music. It's either based on how you look or if you can get some kind of little hook or some popular thing that will become a fad. And then you get in a couple of movies and you, you, know, you act and you get a little reputation. And the whole question of serious musical development and making a statement and really developing what God has given you from a musical standpoint can go by the wayside. But in the case of Harry, I really don't think that's going to happen. What I'm trying to do is make a contribution to American music based on all of the things that, that this country has, has offered historically. Um, blues, swing. American Harmony, things like that. Those are things that I, that I deal with every day when I, when I write music and, and think about stuff. The kind of music that I play, jazz music, is extremely difficult to play. There are masters that have come before me, Duke Ellington, Bill Evans, Miles Davis, John Coltrane, you know, 
These, these are people that, that are incredible. I'm by no means a master of it, uh, but I'm on a quest to, to be a master. All right. And one of the most profound influences that I had was that of funk music, uh, groups like The Meters. And I, and I love that stuff, and I did two albums of that style of music. One was called She, one was called Star Turtle. And this is music that I grew up playing that I love to play. It makes your soul feel good. And then after his two funk records, you know, Harry follows with what is to me clearly his most original and uh, most spectacular body of work, an album called To See You. He wrote an album that was so immensely personal with beautiful melodies that people could sing, but yet was so thoroughly modern. Lovers are dreamers, I've been, been walking in my sleep. He had essentially written, pinned new standards, a new sound, a new way to play. I wake, I'll never take the chance that I can keep. He's going to do what it takes to develop his artistry and he wants to take his audience in a direction. He's not gonna keep repeating the same thing over and over again. He's not content to just be some type of mad near idol that winks at people and looks cute. He's going to develop that artistry. And I've been told a heart of gold melts away. I know what I have, I know what my limitations are. These are things that I, I just know I can do. I may not be better than anyone else, but I'm, I got my own fingerprint, and it's gonna be different than anybody else. I'm very confident in that way. You know, I've heard you know, people say it's egotistical. I say it's his love of sharing himself with an audience, and that's what drives him. has been so gracious and so generous with his spotlight and he never fails to um, introduce you guys like me guys like Leroy Jones guys like um, guys in his band to the to the people I never sang in public and Harry convinced me he just said man you sound you should sing really work on it concentrate on it practice on it Anyway, I'm, I have two CDs recorded, and I'm, and it's interesting because the press and most people around here know me as a singer <laughs> before they know me as a trumpeter. When Harry was on the road, oh, this must have been eight or nine years ago, I was visiting him, and he invited me up to the stage during a, a sound check rehearsal, and he said, Pop, why don't you sing, sing a song? Well, next thing I know, he's working in a club in the French Quarter, two nights a week. He's got a birthday coming up. He said, this was um, yesterday. He says, son, he's, he's awesome. He says, son, I presume you're going to get me a birthday present this year? I said, that's right, dad, I'm, I'm sure I will. He goes, you know what I want? I want an arrangement. And he named me the song, and, and basically that means I have to sit down and write for four trumpets, four trombones, and five saxophones, bass, drums, guitar, and piano, and write him a chart. Okay, stop it. There you go. Action. When I first started acting, I didn't think it was something I needed. The first movie I did was called The Memphis Belle. It was a World War II movie based on the bomber planes, the B-17s. And then I did a little movie that Jodie Foster made her uh, directorial debut in called Little Man Tate. Then I did a movie called Copycat, and I played uh, sort of a psychopath, kind of a crazy killer. That was a lot of fun. Then I 
did a movie called Independence Day. I got killed in like the first 10 minutes. The next film was called Hope Floats, which was directed by Forrest Whitaker and uh, starred Sandra Bullock. What it's like to work with Harry. Um, you know, it's, it's really, uh, the thing about Harry is that he, uh, he, he was born the way that he is now. And, and fortunately, he was raised in a place where uh, no one ever stopped him from being who he was, prevented him from speaking out, from experiencing, exploring, from trying things. Maybe it's not my place to say this. I believe Wesley misses you. People go to school to learn how to be model. natural and to be free and to be uninhibited. He was born that way and, you know, he, he is that way. I would not recommend him go to, to go to school at all. Harry is incredibly instinctive. Harry's, you know, he's on the top of his game in terms of his personality. He's very um, witty, intelligent, incredible memory of a man. And he can, um, he's great, he can, you know, josh and lark about and go around and then suddenly somebody says, okay, first team in and we do it and he turns to camera and he's just doing it. Okay. Action. Jesse, I can't breathe in here anymore. Artistically now, I need it. I can't never act again. I don't know exactly why I do, but I feel like developing these characters and inventing new people is something that's fascinating enough to me to, to, to continue doing it. Maybe my acting career, you know, will bomb. You know, maybe nobody will ever take me seriously as an actor. Maybe I'll never be considered one of the great singers that ever lived or one of the great composers that ever lived. But I'm doing things that I really love, and I think there's ample time to do, to do all of them, you know? I know you so well I can tell by the sound of your voice if you're really in love with me and you are I think um, when we got married the greatest thing to me was knowing that I was gonna have my children with him because he's we will go to a party and if there's kids there, all the adults will be in this room, and then you'll see Harry in the corner with 20 kids around him, and he's telling them this big story, and they're all just looking at him like, oh. I always wondered what it was going to be like to have the freedom from my relationship with my wife stripped away when you have a child and you just can't, you know, pick up and leave. I said, man, that's, that's really going to suck when you have to, like, you know, get up at seven and, you know, get up all through the night when they're infants and all that stuff. But I have never, I've never felt all of those things I was worried about feeling. Like when I hear the, a baby crying, that's my baby, man, I, I, I love to know that I can stop that from happening. That makes me feel greater than any spotlight could ever make me feel. To know that this person thinks of me like I thought of my dad and my mom, you know, when they're, they're like off the charts. Yes, I do. When I get to New Orleans, I want to see that whole parade. Now, don't try this at home. Unless you're cooking bacon and eggs or something like that. Oh. It's, it's been a wild ride for me, and I, I can't imagine the, the person I would be or, or what kind of music I would, play, would be playing had I not been from New Orleans. Come on. New Orleans is a wonderful town, but there's a lot of elements that really bug me. Um, and these elements exist in other cities as well, but because New Orleans is a city I love and I call home, uh, I felt that it was necessary to deal with some of these elements, the main one being uh, pretty severe racism. Mardi Gras is a wonderful social opportunity for people of all, all colors and creeds to gather from all over the world. I noticed that the only black people in these beautiful Mardi Gras parades were either marching on the street in marching bands or carrying torches. So I decided to form a crew, which is basically a Mardi Gras parade, that would include everybody, why the hell not? Black, white, and men and women. Our organization, the Crew of Orpheus, we now have about a thousand members, the crew that Harry and I, I formed in 1993. 
we start uh, and, and go on a, about a six hour ride all through the streets of New Orleans and apparently they had over two million people watching the parade. I'd, I'd never been to a Mardi Gras. I've, I've always come to New Orleans for New Year's and, and all different other occasions but never Mardi Gras. And uh, to see it with him being the leader and, and sort of through his eyes and, and knowing what this parade meant to him which was uh, uh, the integration of everyone. When you think it's almost over, you go back to the convention center through these mammoth doors, and what's there but 5,000 screaming people. And the feeling that you get riding in that huge, huge hall where all of our friends, our family, everyone is gathered, just yelling and screaming for you and asking you to throw that magic barble to them, that, that bead that is so valuable now, but tomorrow it's not worth two cents. We don't go for that Macy's Day Parade uh, concept of, you know, that sort of waving to the camera thing. Man, we throw stuff at you. You, you go down there, you're going to come home with something. I remember Sandra Bullock's float was on the other side of the convention center, and I took my little camera, and, uh, and I snapped a shot of her. You can't imagine a bigger party. I mean, it's, uh, it's no wonder that they have 40 days of... Uh, of fasting uh, after that, because you, you pretty much completely uh, filled the brim with partying after that. Well, I came up to New Orleans, fix what I could find to peace my mind. I gave what I had to the winners. I watched him grow up and I watched him develop uh, artistically. I watched him play the piano and used to take him to his lessons and, and was with him when he was being taught classical music and, uh, and jazz and uh, saw him go into two different nightclubs and so forth. Then uh, saw him on tour, watched him make movies. Uh, he's damn good at what he does. And whether it be the piano, whether it be acting, whether it be singing, whether it be writing, or whatever it may be, uh, I just think that, that um, you know, we're blessed, we're blessed to have him. In my father's house, no harsh words are spoken. In my father's house, no vows are broken. He is the epitome of the complete musician. He is not just a pop singer, you know? He's not just a pop songwriter. He's a singer, he's a songwriter, and he's a musician. He's a musician who sings, which as a musician, we love much more than we love singers. As a matter of fact, we hate singers, but we love musicians who sing. to discover here on earth with sister and brother with imagination. We're going to get there. Well, now, if I stand alone. I consider myself an entertainer. If, if I can sing a song and make somebody say that really hit home with me, or if I can play the piano and make somebody cry or make somebody laugh, or if I can play a character in a movie that's memorable, I love all of those things. With the imagination, you know I'm going to get there. I think the bottom line is that when I'm on my deathbed, I look back and say, you know, I did exactly what I wanted to do, and I did it with, with integrity, and I worked my, my ass off at it to make sure I was the best at it. And, um, you know, just try not to embarrass anybody on the way, you know, make sure my kids aren't like, yeah, that's my dad. <laughs> you know what I mean? Come by me, come love with me, baby. Maybe we could run away.
Now come by me Come talk to me, baby Tell me how You can't come by me 